Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Erika Mtenga, a PhD student at Georgia State University. TOPS is a free multidisciplinary international forum for research with tobacco policy implications using experimental or quasi-experimental study designs. This forum is designed to bring together academics, students, government employees, policy researchers, healthcare professionals, advocates, and funders with the goal of breaking silos in tobacco policy research and providing a platform for high quality research to be discussed and disseminated. TOPS is organized by C. Shang from Ohio State University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Catherine McLean from George Mason University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guideline will be shared with the presenter afterwards even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on TOPS website, tobaccopolis.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2020 season with a single paper presentation by Catherine Meckel entitled The Effect of Smoking on Mental Health, Evidence from a Randomized Trial. Catherine Meckel is an assistant professor of economics at the University of California, San Diego, a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research network affiliate at the Center for Economic Studies and IFO Institute for Economic Research. She is an applied microeconomist whose work lies at the intersection of public finance and health economics. Current projects analyze the role of grocery stores in nutrition assistance programs and the health effects of anti-smoking policy. She holds a PhD and MA in economics from Columbia University and a BA in economics and mathematics from Yale University. Our discussant today is Don Kinkle, professor in the Department of Economics at the Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell University. Catherine Rittenhouse, a PhD candidate at the University of California, San Diego, is a co-author of this study and will answer select Q&As. Dr. Meckel, thank you for presenting for us today. Great, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. We're really excited to share our work with a, a broad audience um, and to get everyone's feedback. So let me share my screen. All right, so let me jump right in. Um, quickly, we do not have uh, anything to disclose, we've not received special funding um, for this project or in general. Okay, so as this audience is well aware, smoking is harmful to the physical health of the smoker as well as those around them. There's a wide variety of anti-tobacco policies aimed both at deterring take up as such as taxes or encouraging cessation, which is the margin that we're gonna uh, focus on. Um, for a full accounting of the effects of these policies, we should take into account their effects, if any, on mental health. Um, and uh, we sometimes have to uh, persuade uh, the economics audience that mental health is an important concern. So um, mental health is a, a large burden on our society. It's widespread um, and it also affects many other outcomes um, among both adults and children. Okay, so let's think now uh, a bit about the relationship between mental illness um, and smoking. Um, if uh, there's, a, there's a very well-known correlation between mental illness and smoking, uh, those who, are, who have mental illness in the United States smoke about 50% of cigarettes sold in a given year and are two to three per, 
times more likely to be smokers. But the causal mechanisms between those two outcomes are not particularly well understood. There can be three hypotheses. Um, whenever there's two variables that are correlated, um, and these don't have to be mutually exclusive, but the first one would be that smoking causes worse mental health uh, through various mechanisms. The second one would be that mental illness causes smoking. And so this uh, is sometimes called a self-medication hypothesis that individuals uh, find that smoking relieves symptoms of mental health. And so uh, when they're having a difficult time, they start smoking. And the third hypothesis would be that those two variables that are correlated are not actually causally related, right? That they coincide in the population due to things that cause both of them, such as um, socioeconomic status. Uh, to briefly review the evidence, very briefly review, um, on the effects of the nicotine per se, on uh, because there are other effects of smoking that could affect mental health. So the effects of nicotine on mental health. Um, nicotine is a psychoactive drug. It acts as both a stimulant and depressant in different settings. Reviews of the literature, uh, the clinical trials, this is a review of the medical literature has found that nicotine can worsen men, uh, mental health or relieve the symptoms of these conditions in different settings. Okay. Um, so it's kind of an open question of how anti-smoking policies would affect the population on average. Uh, as for this self-medication hypothesis, there's some evidence for it um, in that teenagers have been found to initiate smoking after stressful events. Um, and that smokers consistently report that smoking improves their mood, although they may be conflating, um, you know, true effects of nicotine on, on the effects of withdrawal. Uh, there can be also uh, mechanisms that are unrelated to nicotine in terms of how smoking affects mental health. So um, if behavioral changes accompany the initiation of smoking, if you start drinking more or drinking less, um, if it changes your social network, um, or if smokers become depressed, for example, due to a decline in, in their physical health from smoking, those are um, things outside of nicotine that can affect mental health through um, uh, and so in order to untangle all of these different uh, mechanisms, or at least some of them, um, well, to untangle all of them, but then we are only gonna be able to speak um, to them in a specific setting, uh, we really need what we call in economics exogenous variation to estimate causal effects. We need a treatment group uh, that, that of, of smokers or people who are quitting smoking um, that is identical on um, all characteristics to a group um, that continues smoking, okay? Because there are, there are different uh, mechanisms through which those groups can be very different in ways that affect mental health, okay? So that brings me, um, just checking how I'm doing on time, okay. So that brings me to our setting, our data. Uh, we are going to reuse data. Curse me, I, I'm not actually keeping the Q&A open. Um, so let me just open that really quick. Okay, so we are reusing data from the lung health study, which is a study that was um, initiated in the late 1980s. Uh, I will talk about it in detail. Uh, the goal of this study was to, um, you know, I, I said I was gonna try to answer answer questions during, um, while I was speaking, but Catherine, I'm thinking maybe, uh, it, Catherine, my co-author, it might be more helpful given the pace if you try to take on most of those questions. So, okay. So let me get back to the lung health study. So the goal of the lung health study was to study the effects of a prescription inhaler in particular. And since we have a medical audience, I've written down, it's a methacholine bronchodilator um, on uh, delaying COPD. So they took a large sample of somewhat heavy smokers, I think a pack and a half per day um, in middle age who were at risk for COPD. And they wanted to know if pairing cessation with a prescription inhaler could delay the onset um, of COPD. Because it was already known that quitting smoking cessation is effective in delaying COPD. So this was kind of like, can we further delay uh, COPD? Um, which I, I believe that once you're at risk for is kind of inevitable. Um, among many individuals. Okay, so 
Uh, I'll get a little bit more into how the treatment worked exactly, but all individuals in this study were followed for five years after um, an initial uh, cessation treatment. And what's really important here is that because individuals were randomized into being incentivized to quit smoking versus not, uh, we can cleanly estimate the causal effects um, of that cessation treatment. So what, what did the study uh, look like? The study included around 6,000 smokers um, with impaired lung function. They said they're in middle age. Uh, they were uh, recruited at 10 clinical centers in urban areas of the United States and Canada. They had to have um, no se other serious illnesses or plans to move away. We should uh, emphasize up front that this population is not representative of smokers in, in North America completely. They were almost exclusively white, 97%, more likely to be college educated um, than the population of smokers in general. Um, they were from urban areas, and also importantly, they were motivated to quit smoking because they signed up for this trial, whereas uh, the average adult smoker in the U.S., um, uh, sorry, 70% of adult smokers uh, in the U.S. express a desire to quit smoking. Okay. So to get into more detail about how this trial worked, so they took those 6,000 middle-aged smokers, they randomized them into two treatment arms and one control arm. So it was a third, a third, a third. So the control group is 33% of that sample. Um, and then both treatment arms underwent a um, uh, intense, uh, intensive cessation program in early 1989 that stretched for um, a number of months, uh, about eight months total from the time of randomization. Okay, then why do we have two treatment arms? One got a prescription inhaler, one gets a placebo inhaler, and they were instructed to use those regularly during the follow-up period, which was the five years afterwards. Okay, what did the smoking cessation program include? Um, individuals got a message about how at risk they were from a doctor. Then they underwent this kind of behavioral intervention similar to maybe um, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, where they had group meetings um, that their family members were invited to that would emphasize um, coffee machine. Um, first emphasize, uh, they first had a quit day um, and they would get, um, they would learn techniques for, for quitting and staying quitting and, and um, and uh, continuing cessation, um, and then continued techniques for um, uh, for sustaining sustaining their quit. They were given nicotine gum, so they learned techniques for for tapering off of that nicotine gum um, after six months. Okay, um, and then subsequently. Um, there were five years of follow up interviews for everyone um, in the uh, study. So the two treatment arms would return to the clinic every four months during that five years. These meetings were meant to promote inhaler usage uh, and prevent relapse. And then um, both the treatment groups, the ones who had the behavioral cessation treatment and the control group uh, were re-interviewed annually. And this is where we're gonna get our data on mental health. They collected a wide variety of, of variables, including health and healthcare information. And importantly, all individuals were tested uh, medically to validate cessation through uh, pulmonary function and COP9 uh, testing from, from the saliva. Um, the trial, after five years, it was found that there was no added benefit of the bronchodilator, the prescription inhaler. Um, and so in some literature, they, even the study authors have said, oh, this was a, a failure. Um, but uh, in some ways, the, the trial was very successful. So the cessation program was highly effective. At the end of five years, 22% of individuals in the treatment group um, had quit and, and sustained that quit for all five years versus only 5% in the control group. There's relatively low attrition. They consistently collected a variety of measures that we can then use to look at, you know, the causal effects of, of the cessation program on those, those measures in a long and short-term way. Okay. 
And um, briefly, and we discuss this in more detail in the paper, um, there, uh, there's a variety of, of different studies that look at the causal effects of assignment to the treatment. They find increased, improved health, reduced mortality, um, and some other studies have looked at, like we do, uh, measures collected during the five years of follow-up interviews that were not direct um, outcomes for the study. So they found that um, individuals in the treatment group were a bit heavier and that their spouses were more likely to quit smoking. And I'm going to take a break now um, to uh, chat a bit with uh, Professor Kempel. Yes, uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, and um, yeah, I'll give uh, uh, Don Kinkle, our discussant, the first opportunity to provide any comments. Um, you know, I, I don't have too much. Uh, it's a really nice, clear presentation so far. I I was, um, I did want to kind of follow up on the timing. I didn't quite get it. That So the intervention was in early 89, and the first follow well what, what i'm focusing in on kind of is that they also were allowed to have they got six months of nicotine gum and the first follow-up was i guess in early 1990. yeah so i i don't have the exact dates right now at the top of my head basically the way that it worked is when i say first annual interview that was from the time of randomization and uh -huh. There was, there were about, so there were like four months of orientation. Then there was the behavioral intervention. And um, then the nicotine gum lasted for two months after the behavioral intervention. And then the first annual interview happened, I think, two months after that. So that's the approximate timing. And so I mean, we think. I mean, the reason I, I raised it was because. Um, the you know I was wondering if these people could you know you later on you look at the short run effects and you note some maybe um, withdrawal effects. I'm wondering if some of them could still have been on the nicotine gum. I mean at that time nicotine yeah. gum was by prescription still, so I don't know oh. if they've gotten a renewal or not. That's really great to know. Um, so I I think it was it, it changed finish. somewhere in the 90s. Yeah, so they so they were they didn't have that initial six months of nicotine gum. Um, they were supposed to taper off. Uh, there, that was that was supposed to be something that they didn't use long term. Um, but then in the annual interviews, they were, uh, or in the four month follow ups, there were um, techniques used to increase cessation su success. And I don't want to say something incorrect. That may have included um, another prescription for nicotine gum. We have looked, though, at nicotine gum as kind of a first stage outcome and found that um, it is uh, that usage is much lower in the, the treatment group than the control group. So we think overall, overall nicotine definitely is lower in the, the treatment group. OK, so that clears it up. Thanks. Okay, um, and uh, your uh, co-author has uh, kept the Q&A cleared. So I think you uh, can proceed with your presentation. And audience, please uh, continue to add any questions that you have for Catherine and we can address them uh, at designated pauses during the presentation. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we do with the data, I've given kind of an introduction to the trial itself. Um, there were these, among the many measures that were collected during the, um, the follow-up interviews, so these annual interviews that included both the treatment and control group, they asked about people's mental health. Um, and so, just make sure I'm on my schedule. Okay, so, at each of these annual interviews, they ask the following question. Indicate the extent to which you've been troubled in the last four months by any of the following conditions. Severe, and they were supposed to give the extent, they were supposed to give one of these answers. So severe, moderate, mild, uh, or not at all. Um, and we assign these numbers that are in parentheses. So the severe, we would give a three, moderate two, mild one, not at all, zero. Um, the conditions, then the mental conditions, um, are irritability, insomnia, 
mood changes, nervousness, and psychological illness. These are the only questions that were asked in the follow-up interviews about um, their mental state. Okay, we're gonna create from those uh, conditions a distress scale is what we're gonna call it. We sum across the scores um, across the five conditions for an individual I in follow-up year T, right? Where there's five follow-up years. Um, and so if, if people said not at all for everything except for irritability and insomnia, and they gave those to a mild, they would get a score of two. And let's say that happened in year one. They would get a score of two in year one. Um, our second measure is gonna focus on kind of the, the severe distress only, and that's gonna be the share of conditions out of the five for which I indicate severe in year T, I being a participant. Um, so two fifths, if you say I am having severe uh, insomnia and mood changes, and for all the other ones, you say, you know, not at all mild or moderate. The other um, measures that are, are related to mental health have to do with prescription drug usage. So at each annual interview, the participants were uh, advise, were requested to bring in the bottles for any prescription drugs that they were taking. Um, and these questions were particularly relating to prescription drugs that did not have to do with lung or cardiac health. That was a separate set of questions. Um, but they did only ask them about um, up to three drugs. Okay, so um, from those three drugs, we use a variety um, of methods we, we go over in the paper to identify um, antidepressants, um, anti-anxiety medication, and we're going to just uh, ident we're going to code an indicator that equals one. Um, if individual I took uh, an antidepressant in in the the last twelve months before a given interview year or an anti-anxiety uh, medication, those are two separate measures. And then, um, as as Don mentioned, uh, we think about, we think separately about the short and long run effects of quitting. Um, by short run, we really mean the first interview, long run, we mean interviews two through five. For the short run, um, we think that individuals could still be uh, withdrawing from nicotine. Um, and um, so, uh, because as mentioned, uh, they will have quit relatively uh, recently, but more importantly, um, the nicotine gum that they were given would have run out two months before this interview, okay, the, in, in the first annual interview. Okay, so uh, for each outcome Y, so the, the Y outcomes that we just went over, which are uh, the distress scale, the share of severe um, uh, conditions, and then the, the two indicators for taking an anti-anxiety or anti-depression medication, um, which are specific to each interview year, we're going to define the short run outcome to just be that outcome in year one, uh, follow up interview year one, and the long run to be the average um, of, of uh, the outcome uh, from years two through five. Okay, and it'll be clear when I show you the results, uh, which short run versus long run we're looking at. Um, and okay, whoops. Okay, so let me try to go back. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go over the um, the empirical method now. Um, so uh, our our regression that we run is is as simple as you can get, I suppose, we uh, are going to estimate the causal effect of being assigned to one of the two treatment arms. Okay, so when I say treatment, we're lumping together the two treatment arms because the inhaler versus placebo inhaler didn't affect uh, health outcomes. Um, and so we're going to look at the causal effect of being assigned to the two treatment arms versus the control group on a given outcome. Um, that has to do with smoking or mental health. Um, and we're gonna adjust the error for heteroscedasticity across individuals. Um, uh, now, something that is a bit more subtle um, is this is our baseline approach. This is gonna just tell you the difference in means 
um, of these outcomes across individuals in the treatment versus control. Um, and then with the adjusted standard errors, we can test whether those mean they're statistically different and that will give us the causal effect of this cessation program, okay, in the short run versus the long run. However, uh, if we're looking at mental health, um, we want, and, and what we're going to be doing is comparing men and women, um, we want to be able to uh, scale our effects on mental health to any differences in uh, treatment effects on smoking for men and women. So if we find that, for example, um, in the long run, women are much better off and men are only a little bit better off, um, that could be due to different effects of smoking on mental health across genders, or it could be due to different um, uh, treatment effects on smoking across men and women. So if men quit, we're much less likely to quit than women, that could explain that difference. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to be scale, use a, a instrumental variables approach um, and scale the treatment effects on mental health to the first stage effects across men and women on uh, the number of cigarettes um, the, the, the reduction in the number of cigarettes in the short and long term. Why do we use cigarettes versus something like whether or not you are smoking? Well, we find evidence that the treatment affects both the extensive and the intensive margin of smoking. So the extensive margin would be, do you smoke or not? And then the intensive margin would, would be among individuals who are still smoking, do they smoke fewer cigarettes? The answer is yes. Uh, and so we wanna scale really to the underlying change um, in perhaps the, the uh, amount of nicotine that people are taking in. Okay. So as I said, due to randomization, we can say that the assignment of treatment is independent of any differences between the treatment and control group. For example, um, baseline differences in mental health that would cause selection into smoking um, or other characteristics that vary um, across smokers that confound the correlational differences in mental health between smokers and non-smokers that we talked about above. Okay. Um, Make sure I'm in the schedule. Good. Okay. So before I get into the results, um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about heterogeneity that we look at um, by gender and why we do that. Um, and there's there's existing evidence, not from us, uh, but from um, medical studies, clinical trials, and imaging studies. Um, um, as well as uh, survey evidence that um, smoking behavior and the effects in particular of smoking um, and nicotine on the brain vary across gender. So just uh, in terms of behavior, men are historically more likely to smoke than women in every year, in every cohort, in every state. Um, and this is shown really nicely uh, by this study by Holford from Yale et al. Um, and then uh, there's some medical evidence that smoking activates male smokers reward pathways more than those of female smokers. Um, and then if you look at, uh, there was a really nice study that um, incorporated the use of a placebo cigarette without nicotine to try to understand if that effect was driven by nicotine or just something about the act of smoking. Um, you know, just that reminds you of, of, of being happy or something. Um, and, and they found that the effect was specifically tied to nicotine, this difference um, in, in genders. And so we're going to estimate effects separately for men and women. Um, and I think that's where my, my second break is. So I'm, I'm happy to, to answer more questions or further discuss uh, this setup for our study. Okay. I think that, um, uh, again, your co-author is keeping the Q&A uh, clear, but feel free to um, return to that um, if you'd like to, uh, to answer anything. Um, but uh, to start off with, let's uh, go to our discussion, Don Kinkle. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think that's real, real, again, really very clear presentation, everything very interesting. I, I was really intrigued to learn about the nicotine differences between men and women, partly because there's a new proposal out or a pending to be released about these very low nicotine cigarettes. And that's one you know, really innovative way that um, the FDA says it's going to release a standard that would 
reduce nicotine content down to about 5% of what it is currently. And if it's really, it'd be really interesting if that has differential effects by gender, but that, that's just sort of a comment, not really a question for you. Yeah, um, no, I, I hadn't actually read about that. That's really interesting. Um, if kind of for women, it's more about the social act and- Right. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think to a lot of us who think about the nicotine addiction as the problem, this idea of these very low nicotine cigarettes seems kind of crazy, frankly, but you know, right. if, if there are more people that are actually just, um, you know, get the habit. Um, so I had one, I actually, I wanted to circle back to one comment from the um, Q&A that, uh, that raised a question in my mind. There's a comment in the Q&A about ADHD. And I was wondering, it doesn't look to me like the psychological distress scale you have would capture ADHD very well, or what do you think? Yeah, maybe. So I'm not, you know, I'm obviously not a medical practitioner, but from the little I know about ADHD, perhaps the only thing that would be related would be irritability, I think. It might be ADD, I might be mixing them up. Um, uh, but focus is not not one of the... the um, yeah. Interestingly, we do, we're kind of considering thinking about more of the outcomes that are measured. So we do actually have pretty detailed labor market measures. We know hours, when I say pretty detailed, my assumption was it was gonna be employed versus not. Um, but we know like a, approximate hours. Um, and uh, so, or when I say approximate, I just mean it's self-reported. Um, and we haven't found any effects on, on, on that outcome. Again, I don't know, I can't, I wouldn't be, never be able to separate out the effects of ADHD, but when I was thinking about focus, I kind of thought about, well, how's your performance? Yeah. That's my <laughs> um, tangential comment. <laughs> Interesting though. I mean, it's all these, these the data are really fascinating. Uh, one other big comment or question and sort of a thought, but, and then I'll let you get back to the presentation. It was kind of, I was trying to think about um, your, your your basic empirical setup and your short run versus long run made sense to me, but then the long run, you know, was bugging me a little bit about your averaging. And then it occurred to me, I guess, as you were speaking really, that maybe another way of setting up the data would be, you're looking at it like one cross section of 5,600 people that you then see their average psychological distress scores over um, those four years you could think of this as a short little panel of yeah. five observations per person. And then you could do something like put in an individual fixed effect to yeah. capture the unchanging part of their um, psychological distress, or maybe even, or maybe better, maybe their baseline psychology, psychology something like that. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. So in the, the paper, um, in the appendix, or uh, I think on the updated one, we've done this recently, we do like look at the time path and exactly what you're saying. Like we can create a panel, we can look at, you know, if, 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 if this is kind of a long-term effect, I mean, I don't know exactly what, what mechanisms we would expect, but we do see at least the increase in mental health, the improvement for women um, kind of occurring gradually over time. Um, right now we're not, really powered to detect differences across years, but it does occur to me that if we put in individual fixed effects that might help uh, with the power, so that would be like, you know, controlling for fixed characteristics. Um, and so I, I, I also think those graphs are very um, easy to understand, you know, visually. We don't have a lot of visual evidence currently in the paper, so. You know, I, I like the um, dynamic effects in the in the appendix, uh, those, that, that I did see those results. And they're good. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. I, it's the idea maybe of adding that individual fixed effect. Individual fixed effect. Yeah, that that I that I think would really potentially also really help with the power and and separating out, um, yeah, individual versus. Like fixed okay, those are the only questions I had right now. Okay, um, Catherine, there are uh, two questions in the Q and A. Um, Sure. Uh, this is from Monica uh, Adessa. Uh, can some of the effect on mental health for women attributed to weight gain that occurs when one tries to quit smoking? Some people use smoking as a way to lose weight. Yeah, so, um, so we find this improvement 
in mental health for women. Um, so I would think if they're, you know, I don't actually know, remember from the, the, the paper by Kurt Munch, um, and co-authors, if they, if the effects are different across men and women, I actually don't, I'm not sure that they tested that. Um, but maybe from your comment, it would, it would seem that that would be like going in the opposite direction. Like if they're gaining weight, they might be a little bit more depressed. Um, the, what's interesting is women are much more likely to relapse. Um, and, uh, I, I, and maybe I shouldn't say much, but they're more likely to relapse uh, throughout the five years uh, than men. And and it, and that's confusing to us because we see these improvements in mental health for women. Um, uh, so that might be a channel for why they're more likely to relapse. Okay. Um, another question, uh, was any research done or data examined during the NRT phase to detect whether nicotine could be separated from smoking? if there were any indication that smoking might have effects that nicotine alone does not? Um, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure exactly what's meant by NRT. Like the rent. Um, uh, nicotine replacement therapy. Oh, nic right. Nicotine replacement therapy. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I don't believe so. Uh, uh, but I, I, so I think that's kind of an, a question that this study can't, can't um, address, but I think is one of central importance for policy. Okay, that clears the Q&A. Um, so please proceed with your presentation. Okay, great. Um, all right, so now we get to the results with um, eight minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna talk first about Although this has been shown in other studies, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about how this trial was effective at, re at reducing smoking, and in particular um, in sustained quitting, which is quitting in the initial behavioral intervention and then um, uh, sustaining cessation throughout all five years. And I will remind you that um, at each annual interview, cessation was medically uh, validated through pulmonary testing and, and salivary cotinin, cotinine uh, testing. So if we go to our, our table, what I'm showing you here are treatment effects. So this, uh, for example, uh, 0.17 is uh, the, our coefficient estimate of beta. Then we have our standard error. And then uh, we have our p-value of whether um, uh, the, the, the effect is, is differentiable from zero. And the sample here includes pooled. When I say all, I mean both men and women. And then I'm going to show you um, effects separately for men and women. So, oh, and I, I forgot to say, so we're going to look at long run effects first and then short run effects. Okay, so that's just how this is set up at least for now. So remember the long run effects are, are outcomes that are averaged over uh, years two through five. Ex the only exception is when I talk about sustained quit, which is only a long run outcome. That is an outcome that says that I have um, quit in the initial intervention and sustain that quit through all five years. Whereas current quit says, did I quit in a given year as validated by, by the medical testing? Um, and then, so for the long run uh, version, which I'm showing you here, the outcome is averaging uh, whether you currently quit over years two through five. And what's the difference between sustained quit and current quit? Well, there's relapsing, right? So. What we take away from these the the effects in um, columns one and two is that there was a large increase in sustained quitting, 17 percentage points over by comparison in the, the control arm, um, 5% of, of uh, that control arm having quit. Um, and, and why are any of those individuals quitting since they didn't receive any help? Well, we know that smoking is going down um, over time, over the, the, the 90s, and then also because these are people who are getting older and are facing disease risk, maybe that's that's one reason why they're more likely to quit um, over time. But the, the, the effect is about 300% increase for the treatment. Um, if we compare the magnitude of the sustained quit to the, the current quit, what that tells us is that most of the quitting behavior occurred through these sustained quits. So the, 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 the intervention was really effective at, at increasing um, sustained quitting behavior because this effect is about 90% of the current quitting effect 
and current, the sustained quits are always going to be a subset of current quits because people can relapse and have quit one year and then not quit another year. Okay, so we're going to think about um, the mechanisms for our mental health effects that's occurring through um, quitting and, and sustaining quit. And then um, I, I already said it, but um, we look at cigarettes also as a third measure of smoking because even if you quit, even if you don't quit, the treatment may have reduced the number of cigarettes that you smoke. Okay, and that is kind of what we find. Um, if we do a back of the envelope calculation, um, the uh, so people were smoking about a, a pack and a half per day um, and uh, 20, 21 cigarettes. And sorry, uh, what we get if we say, okay, well, let's take that pack and a half and let's let's multiply that by the rate at which people are quitting, we would see on average a, a decrease of four cigarettes per day. We see a treatment effect of eight cigarettes, a uh, reduction in eight cigarettes per day. Um, and uh, that indicates that even among those who didn't quit, they were they were reducing uh, the number of cigarettes smoked to probably going a little bit slowly. So to, to show you then the effects for this is panel B is men only. So this is a, a subset of the sample. Panel C is women only. Um, Basically, what we can take away by comparing their quitting behavior is that the, the treatment uh, was more effective uh, for men versus women. They're more likely to sustain quit. They're more, their current quit rate is higher. If you compare these two coefficients, you can see that women are more likely than men uh, relatively to, to relapse uh, relative to their sustained quitting rate. Um, and uh, the, the declines in cigarettes are on a percentage basis, very similar for men and women because men smoke uh, more cigarettes per day than women on average. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. Um, I think I covered all of these things. Yep. Okay, so let's now, oh, no, three minutes. Okay, let's get to the effects on longer mental health. Okay, so if we look at the pooled sample of men and women, we can see that we have in column one, remember these are long-term effects averaged over years two through five. There's a very small decline in the distress scale. Remember that as a distress scale goes up, people are improving their mental health. As it goes down, they're reducing their mental health. I would almost say that this is, so this is, um, it's noisy, so it's not a precise zero, but it's very small compared to the control mean. Um, uh, noisy effect on, on severe distress same for prescription drug usage. So really we find overall no evidence, at least, of, of uh, effects on, on, on mental health. However, what's striking is that if you then break those long-term effects down for men and versus women, um, we find that um, they go in the opposite direction. Okay, so for women, they see a 10% decline in years two through five of the overall distress scale. And this is statistically differentiable from zero. Um, and the effects on uh, severe distress, anti-anxiety medication, antidepressants, the direction is consistent with an improvement in long-run mental health, although none of these three effects are statistically differentiable from zero. Um, for men, um, all the effects, I guess, except for this effect on antidepressant are in the opposite direction. They're positive, indicating an increase in distress. The effect on severe distress for men is statistically uh, differentiable from zero. It is a large percentage increase compared to the mean simply because uh, there's very few conditions in the sample marked as severe. So this increase in severe distress is affecting a very small share of men in the sample. Um, we also see some suggestive evidence, 10% uh, significance of an increase in anti-anxiety medication usage in the long run among men. Um, what's interesting is although we cannot differentiate the overall effect for men from zero, when we estimate our IV estimates, what we get from that, this is what I'm showing at the bottom, um, is that the, I'll just say what it means, the difference in effects for men and women is statistically differentiable, um, scale to their decrease in, in smoking, okay? So we can say then that women experience improvements in mental health and that men do not experience those same improvements, okay? And we can also say that for a small share of men, um, distress increases. 
Okay, make sure I said all this. So here we look at, apologize, it's a little small. So we look at, we're gonna break down the distress scale into its components. Saying that distress increases 10% doesn't tell us a lot other than that it's a, a met, uh, the effect of the, the magnitude of the effect seems to be important. Um, so remember we had these five components um, and what we find is that the decrease in distress for women is driven by decreases, sizable decreases, especially in insomnia, uh, but also in nervousness um, and, and a uh, somewhat noisy decrease in irritation, but we really don't see anything on moodiness and psychological illness for, for whatever that's worth. Um, for men, um, the effects are almost all positive and so you can really see the contrast and um, and noisy uh, and, and approximately equal to zero. So I wanted to say, okay. Um, so as I was saying for women, the incidence of insomnia goes down 18% and 13% in the treatment group versus the control group, okay. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, if we look at the likelihood, I'm going to go through this quickly and not show you the table because I'm already at my 945. Just take a few minutes. Uh, if we look at um, the, oh, sorry, I, this is actually some stuff I've already said. So to summarize, women's mental health improved through reductions in insomnia um, and nervousness. What's interesting is that for women, we don't find a change um, in uh, the use of psychological drugs at all. Those effects are really small, um, or at least we don't find evidence of that. So we don't think that these improvements were accomplished through the use of medication. Okay, so they, did, well, they weren't more likely to take medications that might've helped their mental health, okay? Um, for men, there's comparatively worse effects on mental health, and there's no decline overall, but a small increase in severe disturbances, as I said. Now, to quickly run through the short-run effects, they're in stark um, contrast for women. Um, for both women and men, um, we find uh, that the, the distress scale goes up. So remember, it was there was a negative effect for women. Now there's a statistically significant increase in the pooled sample that is driven by both an increase for women and men um, uh, in year one, which as you remember, was shortly after the end of their nicotine gum. So we think that they're affected by withdrawal. Um, and, and so we think the long run effects are, are interesting, but these short run effects are really interesting too documenting that um, distress really increases in the short run after quitting smoking. And that serves as potentially an important mechanism for limiting people's ability to quit, okay? And again, in the pooled sample driven by both increases for women and men, severe distress goes up. Um, and it's a large percentage uh, increase, but, but the, the overall share of people who indicate severe distress is very small. So it's a, it affects a small number of people. Um, in this case, we can't differentiate between the effects for men and women. They're very similar, right? They're not going in opposite directions. Um, and so both men and women experience this increase in, in distress in the short run. And I will now conclude by revisiting our three hypotheses, smoking causing mental health, poor mental health, uh, smoking causing poor mental health, poor mental health causing selection to smoking or no causal relationship. What we find is that um, women experience longer mental health gains. This could be interpreted as evidence in favor of hypothesis one, right? That, um, that smoking is, de is exacerbating um, or causing new uh, mental illness for women and that quitting in the long run leads them to uh, find improvements in mental health. Um, this small increase in severe disturbances for men could be evidence, uh, could be interpreted as evidence for hypothesis two, that um, among a small share of male smokers, um, they, those with, uh, who are prone to severe disturbances select into smoking um, and that those severe disturbances uh, reappear after quitting. Again, this is, su this is suggestive um, interpretations um, and so I will just conclude from a policy perspective that policies that aim to reduce cigarette consumption 
um, may have mental health benefits for women, um, whereas cessation policies paired with mental health supports um, may be complementary um, uh, for men and also in the short run and helping people get through quitting. Um, you know, we can't necessarily speak to e-cigarettes, but if these effects that we're showing are due to the use of nicotine, then they may apply also to people who are quitting e-cigarettes. And that's it. I'm sorry for running over time. No problem. I think we're right on schedule. Um, uh, so uh, let's uh, have any uh, uh, questions or comments from Don. Yeah. Um, again, I, I really enjoyed the, the paper and the talk. Um, I had a couple of sort of mainly overarching comments. I mean, one was I will be reminded to say, you know, how much I like seeing papers about smoking cessation as well as other aspects of smoking, because in the policy world and sometimes therefore in the academic world, you know, people really get sort of very focused on youth smoking and smoking initiation. But it's yes. really important to remember that there's, you know, 30 million or more current smokers and that when they quit, they can improve their health. And so, you know, it's a really important margin to look at. So I'm, I'm, I wanted to first, you know, sort of compliment the researchers on that. And, and the, the, the other, you know, another aspect of the big picture that I wanted to be sure to say how much I liked is, you know, this analysis of this, this reanalysis of RCT data but you know, here, unlike you know, medical researchers, not just trying to figure out an outcome, but what's so nice here is that they're using this data from this clinical trial to shed light on this big social science question of why is mental health associated with smoking? Is it just an association with no causality, or which way does the causality go? And so I think that's a, a you know a real contribution that makes this into a social science and an economics paper, not just a, a clinical trial paper. Um, with that said, I will mention that there is an important caveat that uh, I sort of came out, but I wanted to be sure to emphasize it, that when, if you look at the data on uh, mental health and smoking, and especially as some of the self-medication, a lot of that, these days, I think a lot of people are kind of focusing in on kind of these hardcore smokers, many of whom have pretty severe mental illness, you know, schizophrenia and other chronic problems that, and you know, very high rates of smoking among them. And so I think when some of us hear smoking and mental illness, we think about that population. Mm. This is a different population, clearly. I mean, it's actually For struck sure. me as a kind of a remarkably healthy, popu mentally healthy population, not too yes. many problems, um, not too much use of the prescription drugs, even Prozac. I mean, this was 90s. I thought everybody was on Prozac in the 1990s. But I know this. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty low rate of, of using those medications. That could be because they're listing three medications before those, but um, yeah, severe um, distress is, is rare, so. Yeah, and which is it's good, but it's just important. I mean, good for them and good and very interesting to see these things. I mean, the other thoughts I had, I guess, were a lot to try to think more as an economist. I know, you know, this is an interdisciplinary group, so not everybody will you know, be as interested in, in these questions as I am. But I mean, one place to start, I'll start by mentioning is that some of us who have talked about doing cost benefit analysis of smoking interventions um, have talked about the importance of including withdrawal cost in the cost. I mean, this is something yes. that when a policy induces smokers to quit, they're gonna go through the psychological distress um, and that previous work by Chuck Cordemash says a bunch of them are going to gain weight and, you know, all these yeah. are things that, you know, they, they know by no means do they outweigh the benefits, the health benefits, but they are important, immediate cost. And I think along with that, you know, I think that they're all, I wonder if there's, there's some opportunities to push further to look at some of the decisions people were making in those five years that you're following them or they follow them that, you know, people are go, you know, quitting, but then some of them are relapsing apparently because the and then quit. Some of them permanently quit, some don't, and they cut back. And they, we may, have, you know, I don't know if you have the measures of whether they use nicotine gum and all mm -hmm. of these things that you know, kind of these rational decisions. Which I guess I'll leave yeah. I'll end with this comment of that. And I, I really kind of like the two-stage least squares models. Um, 
but and it got me thinking about something I don't, that I've uh, that I I always, a lot of times actually I have a little hard time thinking all the way through about what exactly you're estimating here. I mean, obviously when you're doing the begin the, the kind of reduced form models, you're getting an intent to treat, just whether mm -hmm. or not people are in this get this treatment or not. Other than that, I mean, you're in your two-stage least squares models, you're estimating a local average treatment effect of the people that were induced by the treatment to change their smoking behavior. Yeah. And then there's also this question about like the effect of the treatment on the treated. And that I think brings in more economics about, you know, sort of who's deciding to sort of, it's a little bit different than the treatment. It's not taking up the treatment, but it's responding to the treatment in response to the, to the intervention, but, you know, who is actually quitting because of that intervention and that you could think of more as an economics question and not just a sort of a clinical trial question. But I think that, 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 I think I, you know, feel free to react. And then I think, I don't think I have too much more to say. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know that I have, uh, uh, since we haven't tried, looking kind of at the thinking about how the incentives differ for individuals and how that translates into their behavior. I think that that is something really interesting that we could, we could try developing. Um, and I don't know that the previous studies have, yeah, have really thought about who the characteristics of exactly who is, um, relaxing or, or, or responding to treatment and, um, and ha potentially how that varies with their like baseline mental health. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that could be done there. I, I think I'm just broadly agreeing with you and, uh, and thank you for sparking some of the, this way of, of, of thinking yeah, about I mean, it. I'll, um, I'll, I'll just I'll sort of maybe underline the fact that, you know, you actually have a pretty big sample for five years. We do. People. And, yes. You know, this, a lot of us have looked at cessation, but kind of like in cross sections. And so you don't really know how long they've been quit or, you know, right. we all know there's relapse and requitting and things, but we, but most yep. of us haven't been able to study that very well. Yeah. The short run versus long run um, is definitely something, is a margin that, that, um, well, obviously we're already looking at it, but kind of, um, thinking about how that relates to, to the behavioral deci decisions that are going on, how that relates to a model of smoking behavior, I think is something we could definitely push on. And, and um, so thank you for, for, for bringing that up. It's actually not a comment we've really received, although we've only presented it once before, but seems pretty central. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Don. Uh, there's one um, uh, question in the Q&A, um, uh, Catherine. Uh, so I will read it uh, aloud. It's sure. from uh, Deb Messina. Uh, thank you for focusing on the, the on the people who are attempting to quit smoking. In the lung health study, the combination of the highly intensive intervention program, the strong emphasis on long-term nicotine replacement therapy usage, and regular personalized contact over the five-year study resulted in the high quit rate shown. When lung health study uh, one began, we only had access to nicotine gum. Over the course of the study, nicotine patches also became available. Okay, here's the question. Do you see any implications for extended use of nicotine replacement therapy and or uh, nicotine products such as e-cigarettes with respect to mental health among people who are quitting conventional cigarettes? Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think we should probably bring back, because this is some, well, I, I'm, my answer is two parts. The first one is, um, we should probably bring back the uh, measures of how, kind of trying to get at a holistic measure of how overall nicotine use changed during the trial. So as you said, they, they had access to um, nicotine patches, but they did ask them in later years questions about nicotine gum. Now, we haven't tried to translate that into a measure of, of um, overall uh, nicotine consumption, we've just shown that if you add, like if you do an indicator for are people smoking or do they use nicotine gum? Um, and then the other tobacco measures are, are like very rare. They ask them, do you use snuff? And, and um, uh, we find that an indicator for kind of like any, any nicotine intake um, is, is very effective by the treatment. That's not exactly your question though, but I wanted to say that. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that, 
um, when I've talked to some people who think about e-cigarettes and the cost benefit analysis, um, they're surprised that potentially just the nicotine delivery. So we often think about the harms of smoking um, as coming through the, co the combustion um, in cigarettes. And when you think about, you know, switching to e-cigarettes, we think about that as as potentially a positive for someone who's already smoking. Um, but I, th I think one one um, one interpretation of our findings is that uh, the the nicotine itself has uh, deleterious effects on women's mental health. But I hesitate to make that statement very strongly um, without kind of um, without having thought about that. Um, the extent to which we can really hammer home that that statement and um yeah it depends on if you if you think so so one one way of answering that is we've looked at other margins of behavioral change we don't find any effects on alcohol usage we don't find any effects on the usage of other prescription drugs we don't find any effects on because there are these different effects of smoking that that could have nothing to do with nicotine and and um sorry that's a really long-winded answer but i'm just trying to think that's about that. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Um, okay, uh, Erica, we'll take us out the door. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Happy to answer additional things on email. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 185 people for your participation. Have a top snow weekend.